When trust is shattered, consequences are inevitable. I learned this the hard way after forgiving my girlfriend's first betrayal, only to discover a second, deeper deceit. Here's my story of betrayal, catharsis, and the ultimate revenge on someone who shattered my heart. I met Jane after amicably ending a long-term relationship. I didn't think I'd want to date again, but Jane and I really clicked, and it was such a nice escape. We hung out as friends before moving on to dating, and within six months we had moved in together. I'd long since gotten over my ex, and Jane and I were doing great and regularly talking about the future. I was fairly socially awkward and only had a few good friends before meeting her, whereas she had a large circle of acquaintances and friends she introduced me to who became good friends of mine as well. About a year into our relationship, Jane told me that she had a one-night stand with someone she met at a bar. She begged for forgiveness, said she was sorry, and explained that she was not used to alcohol. Despite feeling hesitant about the situation, I didn't want to lose the relationship. I had invested so much time and thought into my future with her that I chose to believe her. It wasn't easy, and I ended up in therapy for my anxiety. After many talks, tears, and long nights, we gradually rebuilt trust. She regularly reassured me that I was the one for her and that she was committed to our relationship. I confided in a few close mutual friends who kept it to themselves. Everything seemed to be back on track, and I thought we had healed. Another year passes when I notice Jane seems off. She's gone more often, more secretive of her phone. I'll wake up to find her on the computer instead of in bed. Red flags flying. One weekend she tells me she's going to her mother's to help her with spring cleaning. I don't really get along with or speak to her mother. Her mother is an incredibly religious woman who was already upset with Jane for living with me before marriage and a few other personal decisions on her end and feels as if she has control over her life due to financially supporting her, which is why I assumed she figured it'd be a safe bet I wouldn't talk to her mom. A few hours after she left I called her a few times and it went right to voicemail, meaning her phone was off. So I called her mother knowing she wouldn't answer me and left a voicemail asking if Jane had made it to her house safely. It had been hours and I hadn't heard from her. Few minutes pass and she calls me back, tells me that she called Jane and couldn't get an answer, as I knew she wouldn't. Started asking when she left, etc. I told her she left that morning to help her with spring cleaning. This was news to her mother, who never spoke to her about that. Her worrying about Jane had her talking. I sit there thinking about what I'll tell Jane when she speaks to her mom and has time to think of an excuse. She gets home later that night and seems totally nonchalant. Turns out her phone is still off, so she hasn't even gotten the calls from me or her mom yet. Perfect. I ask her how her day went, she tells me how much she hates dusting, there was so much on the top of the cabinets, and how they had to carry stuff down to the basement, an elevator would have been nice, all that good stuff. I then decide to let her know I was aware she hadn't been to her mom's. Long story short, she admits to cheating on me again, and had been essentially since I had forgiven her for the first time. While I was dealing with the anxiety and insecurity, while she was reassuring me it would never happen again and I was the only one for her, while we talked about buying a place and all our goals she was fucking around with the same dude, mostly online but had met up with him every so often for quickies during the day. I basically shut down entirely and went to stay with a friend and told Jane it was over. The more I thought about it, the more my sadness turned to anger and the stupider I felt for giving her a second chance. I had wasted two years of my life and made myself vulnerable to someone I fell in love with, who I thought loved me, and made a fool of me. Jane was inconsolable, calling me, my friend who I was staying with, texting and threatening to show up, in hopes of fixing it. She was on the verge of a breakdown, claiming she'd do anything, talk to therapists, give me total access to her accounts, anything she could do to make it right. To take back the past, which is when I seen the opportunity to get back at her. I told her I wanted to be able to forgive her, but big changes needed to happen for me to do that. She jumped at the opportunity. I told her I needed to be sure she was serious about our future. First, I wanted to look at renting a bigger place, somewhere without bad memories. We were month to month, so I gave my landlord notice and asked her to go through the process of securing us a new lease elsewhere as I couldn't handle it right then, I then told her that if we're going to learn to trust again, I want to start taking steps toward an engagement. I don't want to focus on the past if I do, I want to leave I just want to focus on the future, and the first step should be a joint account. 
I still trusted her with finances, to which she agreed. I deposited a few hundred into the account and told her I had spent the rest of my savings on paying two months' advance rent to my buddy I was staying with, and he'd give it back to me in installments since I'd be moving out sooner than planned. Now that this was set up, I wanted to ruin her social life. But I knew it would take some more plotting to do that. So I told her to come back to our apartment. And we stayed there, waiting out the end of the month. We cried together, she was overwhelmingly affectionate, let me watch her delete her social media pages and made me breakfast most days. She was just so sorry. I wanted to scream at her so badly, but instead I'd ask for comfort and reassurance and play the wounded animal. We had plenty of makeup sex, too, which is the only thing I feel slightly guilty about. She was sure to be extra adventurous for my sake, so when I asked if I could take some photos, she was all for it. During this time I had been distant from our mutual friends, turning down invites and saying things like Jane wouldn't want me to go or asking a few one-on-one -on -one for advice on how they handle it when their partner gets mad. Does your partner ever break stuff or slap you? No, no, Jane would never do that, I was just wondering. Then, shortly before we planned to move into the new place, I had cold feet. Told her I didn't think I could do it. That I just didn't trust her. She was frantic pleading with me not to leave again and begging for something she could do to fix it. So I told her I believed our social circle put her up to her. She swore up and down that no one had any idea. But I asked how could I believe her. She lied to me twice before, I don't trust her around them. A fresh start means new people in our lives too. I'd never feel comfortable again as these people I don't know I can trust were still around. I wore her down until she agreed to ghost them all. But that wasn't enough for me, I told her I needed the bridge to be burnt because I didn't trust them. So I had her rejoin and message the group chat complaining about fake friends backstabbers and how she was better off without them, then blocked them all. She cried for a long time over that, but if it was what I needed to stay, she'd get over it. I had a bunch of messages from mutual friends asking WTF, to which I told them it was complicated, and I'd talk soon. A few more days pass, and moving into the new place is time. We spend the day moving some things in, and Jane is practically giddy talking about our plans. I tell her to pick up anything she needs from her mom, and I'm going to get some stuff from my parents' place, and we'll meet back at the apartment that night. As soon as she left I called my friend, and we packed up everything I had brought over and took it back to his place. Then I messaged my friends, telling them Jane had been abusive the last few months lie, which is why I didn't go out, and that the reason she had blocked them is because she thought I told them, and that they were telling me to leave her. I then went to the bank and drained our joint account, which had about $400 and from me and about $3,700 and in some change from her. Then I sent an email to Jane's mother claiming to be an angry ex who had access to my phone, including all those sexy time photos I took with Jane. Just thought you should know what your whore daughter and that piece of shit get up to. Lastly, I had my friend hit me in the eye twice, swelling it up, then blocked Jane and asked two of our mutual friends to meet up with me. And just like that, it was over. I told them how Jane had become mentally and physically abusive over the past few months after I caught her cheating. I showed them the screenshots of her chats with this guy. I told them I had kept quiet to keep the peace, how she lashed out at all of them when she thought they had been helping me behind her back. How it was so out of character. She threw a remote at me and swelled my eyes when we were moving, and that's when I knew I needed to leave and why I needed to take the money to get to safety. Jane showed up at my friend's house looking for me while he told her I had moved and would call the cops if she showed up again while I hid upstairs. Heard how she frantically tried to find me to figure out what was happening and reached out to our mutual friends to make amends and tell them it was all my idea, only to discover the ones I had been talking to and subtly alluding to being abused for weeks, as well as the ones who remembered me coming to them after the first time she cheated. The ones who had seen my eye had passed the information to her entire social circle. She was met with threats, insults, and being ghosted by everyone she knew. How she told the last mutual friend she spoke to before he ghosted her that her mother had said she'd pray for her and cut her off financially for living an unhealthy lifestyle until she could smarten up after seeing the photos, which she can't prove I've ever sent as her mother certainly wouldn't have kept them and that she's severely depressed. She's trapped in a six-month lease with zero money, no friends to rely on, and no one to help her stay afloat aside from maybe her former fling should she run to him. I'll be using her money to cover the rent on a new apartment for myself, and I bought my friend a nice gift for being my accomplice in this. I plan to stay in therapy, both to get over this, 
and to work through my feelings and how low I stoop to get revenge, as I don't want to carry this negativity with me in the future. After that, I plan to relearn how to be single and enjoy life on my own, with the friends I inherited to keep me company. Edit. And before anyone forgets what sub they're in, I know this was shitty of me to do. But I'm okay with that. And no, I don't agree that this brings me to her level. Fucking over someone who trusted you and never did anything to break your trust is not the same as getting revenge on someone who fucked you over. Coming to this sub and complaining about people's morals is like going to the drug subreddit and lecturing people on the dangers. This happened somewhere in the Middle East. Somewhat lengthy. I-22 met a guy named Ali through my best friend Ahmed. Ali seemed cool enough that we ended up hanging out a lot. When Ahmed, studying abroad, noticed Ali and I becoming closer through social media, he warned me not to let my guard down because Ali wasn't how he seemed and that he'd use me, I wish I had listened, but I did not because I thought I and Ali had become good friends. He was very respectful and thoughtful. Ali is a citizen of the country we live in, I'm not, and he made me feel really bad for him because of the stories he fed me over Hookah and Captagon. He told me stories about how his father abused him, his brother, and his mother, how they're about to be homeless because his father, who lives alone, would not pay rent. He was driving a really messed up car. Once, I was telling him about the dark web and everything that goes through it. He cried and begged me to find someone on the dark web who'd buy his kidney so he could provide for his family. I was sad. It's very bad luck for a citizen of this country to live almost below the poverty line. So I felt bad for him, toppled with Captiga. I was very generous to him, too. Since we met, I was paying for everything. Food, drugs, alcohol, hookah, and we were spending almost all day together. Whenever he mentioned a financial problem, I never hesitated to help. I am a distance student with no job. Still, my father is a very successful businessman and gives me, his only son, a monthly hefty sum. My father is cool and we're like friends. We smoke hash and mainly dips with the bear, a habit he picked up during his college years in the American South, which is illegal in this country. My father gets his hash and alcohol from his friend who lives near a border town and is heavily involved in smuggling. Every six months, my father receives the goodies and pays cash up front. Hash and alcohol are actually very expensive, so six months' worth is a lot of money. The reason my father gets six months' worth at once is that a lot of Western, African, and Asian businessmen visit him. And alcohol is something they all want. Now, Ali already knows all that. Unbeknownst to me, Ali had devised a greedy plan all along. He knew all the procedures involved during that transaction between my father and the smugglers. And he waited six months so he and his other friends could rob them. He sure was using me, and he was really good at it. I told him I was thinking about throwing a humble party when the goodies arrived. He asked me the exact day, and I told him without thinking. And that faithful day arrived, and he and his friends stalked our house until the refrigerated trailer arrived. Before they unloaded it, however, my friend and his crew of six, masked, armed, and impersonating the police, raided our house, cuffed two of my uncles and four of the smugglers and locked them in a room with five other clueless people who were in the house, and the robbers made off with the cash in the trailer. The locked-up people genuinely believed the police was searching the entire house, so they sighted quietly. They didn't know the police had already left. Two hours later, my sister got to a dead-empty house and frantically called me, I was at a cafe blowing hookah alone, thinking my friend Ali was sleeping. When she called, I drove home and started looking in every room, and I found my terrified family and smugglers. I asked what has happened and one of the smugglers instantly laughed and asked me if there was police outside, to which I replied, no, and then he cursed and said, the corrupt police stall the booze and hash. Since that was a common occurrence, usually with smaller amounts, we all thought that was just that. Crooked cops. The tech-savage person he is, my father has most of the house outfitted with high-tech surveillance. My uncle and I started watching, and that's when I realized how good the sound system was. You can hear everything so clearly. I also noticed a very familiar body posture and gestures from one of the officers. I thought, 
Could that be who I think he is? When I heard his voice multiple times, I was dumbfounded and furious. I drove to his home, but his car was not in the parking lot. I called him, and he answered, acting as though he just woke up. I told him that the police just robbed us. He acted all concerned, and I told him I'll be at the cafe. Meanwhile, I called Ahmed and told him everything. He was not surprised at all, in fact, he said he knew Ali and his friends impersonated a police officer to rob foreigners. He told me Ali had actually spent six months in prison a couple years back for theft. I had no clue. Anyway, Ali came to the cafe, eager to hear what had happened, and congratulated me because it could have gone badly. I played along, I didn't tell him shit. I never gave away the fact I knew everything. I was just thinking about how to possibly screw him over. If I called the cops on him and his friends, they'd most definitely rat us out. They're thieves. The stuff had to come from somewhere. I decided to play the long game and think about what I could do to him thoroughly. I also told my dad, and he told me to never tell him that I knew it was him and to try and break contact with him. Since he was a citizen, my father didn't want to bring unnecessary attention to himself because he had a business to protect. Also, my father never got involved directly with hash and alcohol. His bros would take the fall if anything were to happen. My uncle, however, was concerned if they somehow fuck up and got caught, they'd still snitch, so he asked me to find out where exactly they stashed the stuff. After weighing my options, I decided to buy a GPS tracking device and attach it to three of Ali's friends in his cars. I found out the place where all three cars frequented at the same time, and told my uncle. It turns out the house belongs to one of Ali's friend's cousins, Wasim, who happens to be a huge dealer of pills. My uncle then approached Wasim's friend about pills, alcohol and hash, and the friend took him right to Wasim's home. That way, my uncle confirmed probably all the booze was inside. My uncle, 26, then turned the table on them when he and his friends, also impersonating secret police, raided Wasim's home and took every drug and alcohol available. They also injected Wasim with a mixture of drugs, filled his car with all the pills he was selling, and deliberately crashed his car on a highway and placed a passed out Wasim in the driver's seat. I don't think he knew when the real police had caught up with him. My uncle's great plan got me thinking about how I could finally get Ali. I was still angry at him. Ali didn't know that I was bi. That's because you don't talk about that kind of stuff around here. Anyway, I met a guy, Angel, from North America, and neither the U.S. nor Canada, in his final year of studying as an international student. We hit it off, and I started spending more time with him as I continued to distance myself from Ali. Ali still had the money he stole from us, so he didn't care much. His life basically was pop pills, smoke hookah, eat, sleep, repeat. He got that covered for a while. Fast forward a year, and my entire family and the family business moved to the neighboring country. I left behind Angel and I were discussing moving to his country, and I was seriously considering that as well. Finally, when he graduated, we decided to live. Angel would first arrange everything before I joined him after a month. Out of the blue, I remembered about Ollie. I barely saw him in the past six months by making up excuses like, I'm not in the country. Am I just going to live without doing anything to him? No way. I thought to myself. A plan came to my mind. Just like how my uncle screwed Wasim by framing him, I wanted to do the same. I told Angel all about my plans. He thought the outcome could be too cruel. He is a very gentle person. But I assured him that they'd have killed my family had my uncles resisted the day of the robbery. Angel knew a little bit of the story, but he never met Ollie. My plan was for Angel to rent a car a week before his departure. And a day before his departure, he parked it in front of a supermarket while the engine is running to get something quickly. I then stole the car. The camera shows a well-disguised man speeding away. He called the police, reviewed the footage, and alerted the rental company. The rental company then gave him another car. He returned to the rental company's airport branch the next day before departing home. I hid the car I stole at a location where cops would not go to look. I also hid a fairly large amount of drugs and some cash under the trunk lid. I put the keys on the front tire. Then I traveled the breadth and length of the Atlantic Ocean to go be with my angel, Angel. 
after overcoming jet lag and the confusion of time differences. I called ALI on Snapchat and asked him to please pick me mom from the airport within an hour as my uncle couldn't pick us up as something urgent came up at the last hour, but he has left a car at location and the key is on the front left tire. Since Allah's car is a mess, he didn't offer to use his own. He assured me I had nothing to worry about. He picked up the nice BMW rental in less than 30 minutes and he let me know. I'll see you at the airport, were his last words. I put the drugs under the trunk lid because airport security would always, without exception, lift the lid up to check. I let her learn that he got five years for being in the position of a stolen vehicle and the position of drugs with intent to distribute. TLDR the guy I thought was my best friend robbed my family at gunpoint, so I framed him and he ended up going to prison for five years.